Hi, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where you are. Welcome to Hanams with Raxer. My name is Maria Hernandez, developer lead at Rack Wireless. And this is a new series that is designed to introduce our community to the world of Rack Wireless. Basically, we're going to be talking with Rack employees, Rack developers, and customers who are building incredible IoT solutions alongside the Rack products. Basically, for those who don't know or don't know the ties, Rack stars refer to those stars who are creating cool things with Rack products. And I am super excited today to do the first session with someone who has more than 30 years working in the industry. So I'm pretty sure that we will learn a lot from all his stories and experiences. We are going to have a great day, day during the session. If you are here in the live, please feel free to ask any question in the chat. And I will be keeping an eye to the chat every time there is a new question. Also, if you want to share where are you listening to us, you can put a flag or where are you based so we can know uh, who are the people who are joining these sessions. So before welcoming our first uh, Rackster guest, I would like to introduce my colleague, Jose Marcelino, solution architect at Rack Wireless, who will be also joining us during the session. Hi, Jose, welcome. Hi, everyone. Yes, good to be here in the first session. And uh, yeah, good job, <laughs> Maria, getting it, <laughs> getting it out of the way now. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, Mar let's get our guest in. Maybe uh, we have a great guest today. So let's get him in. Hey, Hi, Bryn. Good morning from New Zealand. It's eight <laughs> o'clock here. <laughs> I've yes, got my coffee. It's a very, got my very international session. We have. Uh, I'm in the UK. Maria is in Colombia, and oh, Bryn yeah. is in New Zealand. New Zealand. Yeah. So. Why do we start by with Rin? Like, just telling us a little bit about yourself, about your background, education, and sort of how you get to the IoT world. Oh, well, I've actually got that in my slides, so I can start doing my slides. If you okay, want. perfect. Great. Uh, Great. I, 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 you, are you sharing the screen? Because I can see you. I can. Okay, add to the stream here. One of my favorite quotes. <laughs> so, so I was going to talk about building software beyond the edge. I work for a bunch of different companies. I've been involved in the industry for a long, long time. I, I'm not going to talk about Docker containers. I'm not going to talk about Windows on the edge. I'm not going to talk about Linux on the edge. I'm going to talk about tiny little devices. Basically, when your device has got 8 or 16 megahertz processor, 2K of RAM and 32K of flash. And you select your uh, cellular module because <coughs> of its MQTT native support. So a little bit about me. I finished university in 1988. A three-year degree took four years after first year sex and drinking. Then I had to figure out what course I was going to do, and I opened the newspaper, and there seemed to be a fair few computer science jobs, so I picked that up. After a while, I moved into process control and SCADA. We were running power stations. There's nothing like brings focus to writing software. When your coworker has just blown up a quarter of a million dollar power factor correction bank, or in my case, I set the check wire for Moro Bar, Sarah Chocolate Bar, to King Size when they were making uh, small size. After that, I jumped across into mobile devices and networking, which was interesting. Learned a lot about if, um, modems and MPT 1327, 1343, which was a standard use throughout the Commonwealth. Uh, then I did online gambling. It taught me a lot about scale and perf and doing maths at scale. And now I do fintech applications, working on AML and CFT, anti-money laundering and counter-financing of terrorism software for a while. Now I do foreign exchange hedging. I have a sideline in IoT, hardware and software integration, and I run a couple of maker schools after school, uh, maker clubs at schools on Thursdays. I also run scholarship programs uh, for year 13 students, and I figured this was how I would start my chat out. 
I'm a Microsoft Most Valuable Professional. I worked for Microsoft in the early 2000s, a long time ago. I was first awarded in 2015. There are 37 of us in New Zealand. There are two of us who specialize in Windows and Windows Embedded. There was a third, Atta, but he was killed in the Christchurch terror attacks. We have deep technical knowledge in areas. My specialist areas are Windows Embedded and uh, associated tooling and Azure IoT. But I couldn't make a living with those, so I do a sideline in uh, Azure, General Azure Dev. My specialist area is weird stuff. If you want post-mortem debugging of core dumps to figure out why your multi-threaded app is dying, or you want to lift and shift an MSMQ and classic ASP app to the cloud, I'm your guy. I specialize in things which are just weird. Um, if you want to know what products Microsoft is going to kill, follow me, because everything I get interested in, Microsoft puts a bullet in after a while. So this is my student's project. My wife's cousin has a walnut tree farm. It's 10 hectares, but for those of you who think in um, freedom units, that's roughly 28 hectares, uh, 28 acres, has 35 cells. And these are important because this lets us try different strategies. We're looking at building a, uh, she's built a SaaS package, and then we're going to have a go at doing it hardware as a service as well. It's all about blight. If you don't spray at the right time, 40% of the crop can be taken out by blight. And the copper spray that you have to use is um, not poisonous, but it builds up in the soil. And if you've a, a, got an organic certification, you can only spray so many uh, kgs per hectare. The first version is Laura, and the second version is Laura Wan. Mia, we built this system. This was her first serious hardware encoding project ever. Uses a custom 915 megahertz LoRa module, and we learned a lot. We learned about, well, she learned about condensation. She, she learned a few times that you got to thread the wires through the cables before putting them in the screw holes and taking photos as you go so you can reassemble it afterwards. It's got a small solar panel, a LiPo battery pack, a weatherproof SHT20 temperature sensor, and on the far right, a moisture sensor. That moisture sensor is one of the few that I've can, found can survive immersion or being buried under the soil. I got to talk to them though about making the cable more UV resistant because here in New Zealand, the UV levels are pretty high and plastic and cables tend to rot if you've got the wrong soil. Her system currently dumps out to Azure I, uh, to Adafruit IO. It's really cheap. The devices automatically provision themselves. And for a student doing a school project, it's free for the for the small version. We've only got four or five sensors. We didn't need the unlimited storage. We just needed to draw some graphs for her presentation. It's LoRa based. And one of the things that really frustrates me about this industry is people tend to use LoRa and LoRaWAN as synonyms. A number of times I've looked at, at adverts or specification documents and it says LoRa, and then when you drill into it, it's actually LoRaWAN. LoRa is the physical layer. I've built a series of wireless gateways which work on LoRa. Uh, they connect to Adafruit, Azure IoT, Lysant, Bosch, my devices, Walkabout, lots and lots of technologies. The, it all runs on a Raspberry Pi and uses Windows 10 IoT Core, which on that Raspberry Pi platform, Microsoft has killed. The next version is going to be LoRaWAN based. It's quite a different mindset from building software on uh, desktops. Ain't got a huge bandwidth. You can only send messages every minute and you've got to be really aggressive about power consumption. In the farm, the range isn't too much of a problem. And here in New Zealand, we use AS923, which I've struggled to find devices which support the rack wireless modules do, which is great after you've flashed the hardware. So I'm sorry, this is a rack wireless presentation, but I've got a Dragwino device. We needed a device to hang in the trees. And the problem is we couldn't use, we found we couldn't use the solar panel device because the canopy 
reduced uh, shaded the device so much. So we had to find a device with the right battery chemistry, which we could hang in the trees and it lasted for a couple of years. The um, blight season is only three or four months long, so it was we can take them down and turn them off and put them back in the barn. And the price was pretty good. We also have to dry the walnuts after they've been harvested. So we got a bunch of these. The walnuts get put into bags, uh, flat, like big foul bags. They're basically hip high. And then they're put in shipping containers and warm air is blown through them. And we've got to keep them at just the right temperature. Otherwise, they go moldy or they dry out too much. And because this is a, a, an organic niche product, we've got to maintain maximum quality. Colin has a bunch of hardware, expensive hardware, harvesting machines, tractors, um, mowers. There's even uh, specialized machines which shake the trees at the base to get the um, walnuts off and spray irrigators. So we've got devices like the one in the picture, like this, which we're bolting as a value add to the platform. To We can provide them to bolt onto hardware, the immovable or movable objects. Because um, it's a orchard, there's lots of dangerous stuff. The harvesters, the spray irrigators, the mower is a nightmare because you've got to be so careful with the mower in summer when it's dry because you can start fires. And stones come out of it like little bullets. So we, Colin has one of those to wear and we'll track him around the farm and see what he's doing. We also do a line and trialling stuff. Sometimes we need to just knock together a sensor to get it to go. Quick and dirty is what a developer would say. Quick, um, short schedule and cost effective would be what a manager would say. I tend to use a lot of Grove gear because it just plugs in and you can buy a whole bunch of sensors. They've got a lot of libraries for these sensors, but some of the libraries aren't too great especially the ADXL345 one. Learned that very painfully. At home, I use a, the purple box. My wife complains about it because it sits on the end of her desk. And every so often, she knocks the power pack out and it stops working. Down on the farm, we're going to get something a bit more robust. We can, we've got a pole set up on the roof of the barn. We'll bolt this up. There's a UPS down in the barn for some other gear, and we'll just plug into that. And we'll most probably hitch it to the Things Network. Uh, there's a bit of coverage for the Things Network in New Zealand, so we'll become a node for it. We're just down the road from a agricultural uni university, so we might see if they've got one. One of the other side projects I've got is three of the schools I teach at. I'm trying to convince them to put a node from the Things Network like that on the top of each building, and that should give them most of the northwest of the Christchurch where I live, good coverage. So I'm an Azure guy. I build software on the Azure platform. I get involved in a few consulting gigs and people go, oh yeah, you got some Azure skills, come in and sort this out for us. I don't do websites. Over the years, I've worked with some very talented web developers and I'm most probably colorblind so I stay away from it. The whole idea with Azure or AWS or Google Cloud Platform or the IBM Platform or the uh, whatever SAS or PaaS or IASS Platform, you can start small and just grow. The whole idea with Mia's project was to just smart, start small with one farm and then we can bolt on more and more and add more functionality over time. The architecture diagram. This covers off the V2. We've got, I built a things network integration. The first version uses the HTTP integration and a bunch of Azure functions, which I'll talk about in a bit. I'm dumping the data out into Azure IoT Central so you can see some nice graphs and the devices are automatically provisioned. Uh, all the source code is on GitHub, so you can have a laugh at my expense. It's a bit of a work in progress, but I've been stress and soap testing it with thousands and thousands of units. The less code I write, the less code I've got to debug and delete. I, I always 
instrument my application so I can postmortem debug and figure out what's going on. I use Azure IoT hubs for scale as equivalents in the AWS world with MQTT based and so forth. And I use the device provisioning service because uh, I don't want to have to individually provision each device both in the things network and then again in my app. Everything is leveraged off the cloud plumbing. I don't want to write any code. One of the things that I find when I go into customers is they go, oh, we're going to, we want to rip all of our software or hardware out of AWS and move it to Azure or rip it out of Azure and move it to AWS. Realistically, whatever platform it's in, if it works, just run with it. It'll be fine. They leapfrog each other. Six months, one platform's ahead. Six months, the other platform's ahead. I've had people try and build their own Azure IoT hubs in Node. I've got one customer who's got that currently. And the thing with building a gateway from devices to the cloud is you've got to authenticate them, you've got to support routing, and you've got to integrate it with them. Uh, and Azure IoT hub starts at $10 a month. Right, that is the basic tier. You can do 400,000 messages a day for, of a maximum of 4K. And realistically, a 4K message, you're not going to do that with uh, LoRaWAN anyway. The, my gateway. It took a while to get this working. Initially, I started off with an API level integration into uh, the Things Network version 2. That seemed to be going fine, and then I got a login for a Things Network version 3, and it all went to pieces. They substantially changed the API. They embraced gRPC, and it just hurt. So what I've got now, I've turned it on its head. I'm using an HTTP application integration, and then under the covers, I'm using DPS, to the device provisioning service, to automatically provision the devices as messages come out of the uh, TTN integration. I can map your application ID uh, in the Things Network to a DPS ID scope, which controls the realm of your um, registrations. It's designed for if you've built a SAS app. I can map your application to an enrollment group, which is the secret crypto magic, which lets the enroll enrollment occur auto magically and then I can also map to port ID and scope and port ID and enrollment group so you can have uh, a device which is uploading data to uh, an application and then you split it based on its port number so you might send GPS data up on port one and temperature and humidity data up on port two and they arrive at the gateway and one turns left and the other turns right. Got a lot of support for retries and currently it does device to cloud and I'm Working on cloud to device, but a wee bit more about that. Currently, I'm just dumping it into Azure IoT Central, which is Microsoft's SaaS IoT offering. Everything is templated. You've got lots and lots of pre-configured devices, and it works in device groups. You can automatically provision things. There's a whole bunch of magic going on behind the scenes. They basically forced you to use Azure DPS, which is fine once you've got it sorted. And one of the painful things is that the telemetry payloads, the JSON payloads, the uh, latitude and longitude are different. They use lat, lon, and alt. And the thing that really winds me up is MMDD YYY dates. It's got it in a few places, and it makes it really difficult, particularly in the earlier parts of the year. Initially, it was pretty expensive on a per-device basis, but it's got a lot cheaper. <coughs> I'm now building a version 2 gateway. I look upon version 1 as a learning experience. The new version is using an MQTT client for the Things Network. And then on the other side, I'm using an AMQP client application. I've looked at two. AMQP libraries. There's AMQP NetLite, which works on everything from little devices all the way up to uh, the cloud. It's cool, but I've got a bit of worry about some of the threading going on behind the scenes. And then there's uh, Microsoft's AMQP library. I can't find any docs about it. And the only way I've been able to figure out how it works is pull apart their device client libraries. 
It's really important when you're building a gateway to take care of connection pooling so you don't run out of critical resources. And spinning up a thread for every client is going to end up as a world of pain, particularly with you know, thousands and thousands of clients. I need to think about queuing bits of the application so I can um, have the equivalent of the Netflix chaos monkey turning bits of it off to make sure I've got it running well. For a while, the software wasn't working. The sample data that they provided had an additional comma at the end of one of the lines. The JSON package failed silently, and I couldn't see messages. I spent a while staring at it. It wasn't until I pasted in one of my sample messages that I realized that that one comma was causing the JSON serialization plumbing to blow up, and it wasn't returning me an error message. So if you've ever tried to send messages via the Things Network and it's just not working, look for the surplus comma. In the Microsoft world, there's a whole bunch of buzzword technologies. AWS and GCP have similar but different stuff. I use IoT Hub a lot. It gives me a way of managing thousands and thousands of devices. It's pretty secure. You're only allowed to connect to it with protocols ending in an S, which can be a real problem for tiny devices which can't do that, so you end up putting in a field gateway. You can manage them, you can shut them down, you can script stuff into them. There's an API so you can provision them from third-party applications. And at 10 bucks a month for the entry point, it works really well. You can run device twins, uh, have parameters on the device and in the cloud, which automatically sync so that you can say, this is my software version and it turns up in the cloud. And then you can get a list of all of the devices running a specific software version and force the download of updates to them. As I mentioned before, I use the device provisioning service to automatically provision devices. You can do it with X509 certificates, or there's the magic crypto that I use to provision devices using a serial number or a hardware uh, TPM. It'll uh, support you having multiple in a SaaS environment, multiple customers provisioning devices. Using the API, you can do the QR code provisioning process. And uh, you can geo shard it around the world so that devices in Europe will get the uh, Azure IoT hub running in West Europe or North Europe or Germany or France, depending. And then you can also load balance as well so that you can shift the devices around the world. It's pretty cheap. So getting started, it's 10 cents for a thousand operations. So if I want to do a test run with 2000, uh, 2,000 simulated devices that cost me 20 cents to provision them all, which is basically nothing. I use Windows 10 IoT Core. It works pretty well. Lots of GPIO access, I2C, uh, SPI. I've got drivers. I've written drivers for uh, uh, Semtech modules, the SX127X, the SX1231. Lots and lots of drivers in RS24. I'm sort of over it now. I haven't tried IoT Edge. It's basically running containers on the far edge. And it's great if you're doing um, social distancing using machine learning or looking at stuff to figure out whether the product's good. But I'm not certain that de delivering a Docker container over 3G is going to be a happy place. And I'm pretty much certain that it ain't going to work over LoRaWAN. There's the glue. So in an AWS world, for example, Azure Functions are lambdas. It's a scale-on-demand data pipeline. I can manipulate the data as it goes past, and I can enrich it. We've got Event Grid, which is a global-scale pub-sub messaging service. Services, service bus is designed for interrupt with uh, enterprise applications. So if out of the back end of your app, you're spitting data into a, a SaaS or a, a Dynamics or an Oracle application, Service Bus is the thing. Behind the scenes, I use Keyvault. Keyvault provides FIPS 140-2 compliant HSMs and all of the crypto magic so that I don't get the opportunity to get it wrong. 
It even is down to the level where you can embed in a, uh, in a, a string with a, preceded by an at and a configuration place, and it will automatically extract the necessary crypto keys from the key vault as long as you're running in the right identity. Logic Apps is for complex workflows, sequencing and interaction with humans and timers and so forth. The stuff that people really get interested in. Cosmos DB is a global scale database that's got complex models for uh, ACID, atomic consistent, independent, and durable. It's got high performance. It's sort of like a combination of Cassandra, which I used to manage and deploy clusters of, uh, Kafka, and one of the graph databases, say like Objectivity. I use ML.NET, which is a bunch of uh, code which can run on Windows boxes, Linux boxes, Apples, and so forth. It's a C sharp wrapper around an ML engine, and you can upload TensorFlow models and stuff like that. And it's great if you want to embed some machine learning logic inside a website or inside a Azure function to process data. I've been playing around with anomaly detection for one of the finance jobs I do. You can teach it about seasonality and uh, ranges of data, and you just throw data out, and after a while it learns enough. You say, hey, this has a season from this time or this day and so forth, and it can provide a pretty good indication of when things have gone. Stream analytics is like a pump you use to move data around and also take rolling averages and things like that. I use it a lot for just picking data up out of my IoT hubs and dropping it in into hot and cold and warm storage. And then there's Power BI to visualize uh, your data. I've used Grafana and other tools like that as well. There's one thing that surprises people. It surprised me when I first saw it. Microsoft has its own LoRaWAN network kit. I played around with it and it seems to work pretty well. You can use a bunch of standard gateways, uses the Simtech UDP and TCP protocols. It's, it works pretty well, but for me, it's a bit, bit of a pain in the ass because it doesn't do AS923. I was looking at diving down into the guts of it and then submitting some PRs to see how it goes. I started my career at Microsoft looking after embedded devices. Microsoft used to play in this market quite a lot. I've written code for barcode readers like the symbol device in the middle. And there was even a technology called the .NET Framework, which ran on those watches. It was a really stripped back um, C Sharp and VB. I worked with Windows CE and process control applications and with the right hardware, it could be, even be a, a deterministic real-time operation. I then moved on to Windows 10 IoT Core and I even had a bit of time with Windows Phone and Windows Mobile. So basically everything I've been in, interested in, they put a bullet in. For those of you who are interested, there's a .NET Nano framework, which has just joined the um, .NET Foundation. That's a SparkFun single channel gateway running a .NET parser and processor. I can download c -sharp code to that, and it just works. They're a nice group of people. The Discord formats are, uh, Discord is nice and friendly. It's not like some other forums, like the Arduino forum. People can be pretty rude. Um, they are porting it to lots of other platforms, and some Microsoft people have been contributing, adding libraries and so forth. Then there's larger devices like this one. It's got an LCD screen, and you'll notice on top the Rack Wireless module. The Rack Wireless module worked with jumpers. I basically sat it down next to it and used a bunch of DuPont jumpers and hitched it up worked. But when I popped it on the top of the board, it didn't. So we're going to talk about invalidating the warranty later on. There's also the Tiny CLR, which is a really great polished offering. Gus, who owns the company, I assume, based from the GHI. Uh, he's a really good guy. He invests a lot of money teaching kids how to code and so forth. It's the sort of the top end. It's designed for use in FPOS terminals, petrol pumps, and things like that. And it runs a version of the .NET framework, cutback, tiny CLR, which dates from the days of the .NET micro framework. It's got Wi-Fi. They've even got a version which looks like a micro bit for educational applications. It's got secure hardware, TPMs, and it's got pre-baked libraries for Azure, AWS, GCP, and all sorts of different 
cloud platforms. This is the device I built my rack wireless driver on. It's got a fairly powerful processor, plenty of RAM and a micro SD socket. You can even get Wi-Fi on them baked in, which is cool. Yet again, the Wiz node worked next to the device with jumper leads, but it didn't work when I dropped it onto the device. After looking at the circuit diagram, because I originally wanted to be an electronics engineer and I've always kept my hand in, I had a look at it and I thought, ah, oh, it's not starting right. And it started to fail badly when I connected the reset pin. So I took a pair of wire cutters to the zero ohm resistor for the reset pin. And things started getting better. I then figured out how to flash the bootloader and flash the firmware because they were pretty up, uh, older versions which was a bit of a pain. I then tried an SPI screen on top of my WizNode, and that didn't work. I went back to the circuit diagram again and found that the um, D0 and D10 and D1 and D11 were connected. So those are basically the chip select and the one of the SPI pins. So I Got my wire cutters out. You've got to use very small wire cutters, not the sort that Sparky's used because you can't get them in. And chopped out R17 and R19. And suddenly it all sprang into life and worked. Sometimes you've got to make it work on an Arduino and you can't use D0 and D1, so I can run jumpers back to D10 and D11. It's not pretty, but it works. There's also another option which uses the rack modules. You can buy a PiFat from PyCom. They're not cheap. I looked at the module, uh, the shields that they provide for micro bits, and they were way more, maybe twice the price of the actual micro bit. These days, I sit it on top of a RPI running some variety of Unix. I can download code from Visual Studio. It's running the .NET Core 3 runtime. I can build, download, and debug. It's great. Uh, if I'm doing Arduino Deb, there's a plugin for Visual Studio called Visual Micro, which lets you download and debug code on an Arduino-style device, or I use Visual Code with Platform.io for some of the STM devices, and it all seems to work pretty well. With the <coughs> um, libraries for .NET Core, I can still get it all the hardware, and I can build apps fairly quickly. As part of my project, I've also built projects, I've built a, a low power protocol encoder decoder so that I can stream data from uh, hardware devices that I've built up to the cloud and then have them unpacked by the Things Network. And uh, one of my students learned a wee bit about the accuracy of the GPS positions and how they tend to snap to points. So that's a series of GPS positions. The GPS was actually static and it wasn't going anywhere. Uh, and you can see it's moving around basically in, oh, I reckon that's about 100 meter nodes, or maybe 10 meter nodes. I'd have to look at the scale of the map. It only supports the first round of types, not the version two types. So it, that's pretty reliable. I've got to look at, um, the decoder some more because I've got to figure out a graceful way of unpacking all the different data types. Most of my code is pretty stupid. My focus is on simplicity, ensuring that it's readable. And this by Mike Kaufman really caught my attention. I've been doing dev for 30 years, so I'm most probably well beyond the dev after 10 years point. Often my code ends up a bit long. I tend to go for long linear code. Sometimes when I'm looking at samples from different vendors, I spend a lot of time pressing F12 to go to the implement, uh, to go to the definition or in my environment, control F12 to go to the implementation. It drives me nuts. I spend more about and more time learning their framework than I do actually learning about their product. You know, error handling, dependence injection, uh, services, interface implementations, design patterns, etc. are great. I'm not dissing them, they're great, but if you're trying to learn about some new things, you want to keep the sample code really easy. You know, don't even have error handling, just say, hey, it's going to blow up and stuff's going to happen. So don't worry about it. 
One of the other uses for all of this tech is my longboard. I'm not allowed to drive because I'm epileptic, so I thought, what can I use this technology for? It does 30 kilometers an hour flat out, and it really hurts if you fall off. I've always got a helmet on so that if I fall off and I don't hit my head, because I really can't afford to hit my head too much. It's a small plastic lunchbox. It was the only thing I could find which was low enough profile and fitted the batteries. It uses a wee chuck, and the next version, currently it's only one wheel drive, the next version, I'm going to do traction control and anti lock. That one should do sort of 45 to 50 kilometers an hour. There's a four wheel drive. Some people have built four wheel drive on road and off one devices, and they do in the region at 80 kilometers an hour. And that's just going to hurt. You want to be wearing leathers, a helmet, and an armadillo, and all of the gear because if you fall off, you're going to end up in the emergency room of your local hospital. So how are we doing for time? Yeah, that's good. So here we go. Show and tell time. This is where it all goes horribly wrong. So this first demo is uh, some C-sharp software running on a Fez Duino, and I've got a, uh, what's that, Silicon Labs SI70 something temperature sensor. It's hitched to the uh, uh, gateway running on the end of my wife's desk. So if we kick this into life, uh, USB, sorry, just got to make sure it's all plugged. Uh, it's not plugged in. There we go. So it's now downloading the code, firing up. With this device, you've got a TPM on board, so you've got a secure repository for any crypto keys you want. It's now rebooting. Some magic is happening. He says, hoping that it's all going well. Oh, yep, here we go. And I've now hit the first breakpoint. I'm establishing a connection with the, um, the card, opening a serial port, firing up the device, and hooking up some message handlers for responses and for inbound messages. So if we now let it run, I'm now waiting for it to connect to the Things Network. And there you go. We're sending data. If I now flip to... Uh, my things, cons things net console. You'll see the device join the network, and it sent a message. And we've got the barometric pressure and temperature. Basically, that started on a .NET device, ran through the things network, which is built on varieties of Linux with an application written in Go read a lot of Go to figure out how the gRPC works. It then uses a .NET-based gateway to get into Azure IoT. So if we get really keen while that's doing, if I can code and if I can talk and fire up Azure IoT Central at the same time, I should have launched that. Um, it's all pretty robust and reliable. Runs for weeks and weeks at a time. The main thing that I get is uh, children unplug stuff so that they can charge their phones. It's the major reason. It's frustrating. Or the cleaner knocks the power pack out of the container. Oh, sorry, out of the power board. So here we go. This is my Azure IoT Central application. We'll just bring that across. We'll dive in there. So I've got a bunch of sensors dotted around the house. They're the, these rack modules. And this is the dashboard. You can see the orange line is actually the garage. It gets a lot warmer during the day and then gets a wee bit cold during the night. Sorry, the blue line is the garage. So you can see overnight it got down to... 10, 
So it's spring here. And then we've got some GPS locations and so forth. I can provision devices so I can go and choose some device groups, environmental sensors, and then sunroom, which is my son's bedroom. And then I can look at the raw data coming out of there by clicking on here. It's, it works pretty well. It's a bit of a work in progress. You can see the freedom format dates. Um, I spend a bit of time using this for a few customer projects and it seems to work pretty well. So here goes the next demo. Stop that, get rid of it, flip to the other one. So this is running the .NET micro framework. So the .NET nano framework, it's uh, this device here. This is just one of the devices I've got. Similar temperature sensor to the other one. It's got a nice big LCD screen and people tend to use those in like point of sale systems and kiosks to go in shops and stuff like that. So if we fire it up, there's always this moment of terror. Oh yeah, when you press F5 to kick off the process, got to choose the device. I always forget to do that. So the nano framework, people are doing lots of work improving it. One of the things that it, uh, the, the .NET plugin used to do, right, here we go. Just plug it in and run it again. It was seize control of the um, all of the serial ports on your device. And that was really awkward if you were trying to debug a nano framework device and an Arduino device together. But now they've got configuration to um, restrict the serial ports you use. So it's now downloading the code. Magic is happening. Hear the terror in my voice. We've now hitched up to the device. We're initializing it and we press F5 and run. We're getting the connection to the local gateway. I've tested it with both um, ABP and OTAA and we're now sending messages to the cloud. And if I flip back to uh, the Things Network console, you see a new device is We'll sign up in a moment and start sending data. There we go. Magic has happened. One of the things that I can do with the nano framework is, and both the nano framework and the tiny CLR is they've got pretty active power control, power conservation features. So I can hibernate the um, uh, rack module and the device and solar power is well in play. So here we go. That's, yep, we're sending messages and then I can actually send messages down to the device. So this is going to blow up in my face. Oh, sorry, rack was not two. Uh, port one, send. One of the problems, of course, with, well, no, it's, it's just a fact of life with LoRaWAN. A lot of cloud apps expect an instantaneous response. And if your device only sends data every five minutes with a Class A device, it wakes up, listens for a bit, and then dozes off. I haven't actually got many Class C devices, so hopefully this device will wake up shortly and start um, receiving data. Uh, I've used the Rack Wireless breakout modules, the XB format ones, and I'm sort of hoping someone's going to do a microbus or a micro E formatted device because quite a few of the tiny CLR boards have um, uh, a micro E format socket. I'm also interested in having a go with the belt mounted rack tracker, put some fall detection software in. Some of my other students are looking at an app for tracking old people. So if an old person legs it from a, a, uh, a home, they can uh, follow them using national LoRa WAN network. So I guess that's me done. If there are any questions, feel free to type your questions in the window. I've done about three quarters now, which is a reasonable chunk of time. Are there any questions?
ha Brian, thanks for, for your presentation. It's pretty interesting, all the things that you have done. Personally, I have been work with I two years, three years ago, I think a little bit with the um, IoT uh, Azure Hub, but I haven't done like so much. I, I was working more with um, IoT platform like enablers than the infrastructure one, but it's pretty nice. I am going to look forward to, to test a, a few things that you have been sharing us you know, to, to learn more about those, those tools. Also, uh, let me check the comments. We have any question here. Uh, okay. Well, okay, we, we don't have any question in the comments. Jose, I don't know if you would like to. Yeah, it was super interesting, right? Uh, so many projects. Um, have you, I'm very curious about that nano framework. Um, is that, do you think that's ready for a commercial, like a commercial product to use? Is that? Uh, yep. uh, there are a couple of companies using it for commercial products. There's one who does uh, systems for monitoring hardware and uh, oil refineries. Oh, wow. Okay. And uh, production fields. I've got a box back here. Where is it? <laughs> yep. So you can see the lights flashing in the background. That's a field gateway. So these are the sort of boards it runs on. So there's a 429 Disco. Yeah. Yeah, uh, 901 RC, uh, another discovery board, mm -hmm. uh, bigger discovery boards. <laughs> I've even got uh, quails. So one of the interesting boards that it runs on is a microbus quail. Oh, here we go. Oh, that's the, the big board for them, right? Yeah. So uh, here we go. So. The microbus quail mm -hmm. has four micro E sockets. No, it's not that one. And then you can plug devices like that in, which is an NRF24 gateway. One mm -hmm. of the cool things that they built was actually these watches. It's watch. oh, the NXP is watch. <laughs> yeah, you can program them. Mm -hmm. The tool chain's a bit of a pain because you've got to use. Uh, specific versions of GCC and so forth. When I'm building, I use um, Platform or IO or Visual Debug, which have got, um, for example, Platform IO is really good, but GC, uh, Visual Debug gives me uh, GCC into Visual Studio. So that's the Quail platform. It's got four micro E sockets, and you could, there's even earthquake detectors, pulse rate sensors, and stuff like that. Um, Jose, the guy who does the uh, .NET Nano Framework, I think is based in Portugal, and oh, he's got a, he works for a I'm company called. As well, uh, yeah. I, I figured. Um, yeah. He's um, his company Eclo, I think it's pronounced. Mm -hmm. Use the plumbing. There's a crowd who've built a um, like a petrol station, I think it is system, and they built their own hardware and done a port. The the HAL and the PAL. Everything is open source. Basically, you sit down with a copy of GCC and go for go for it. There's uh, batch files for building it and compiling it, and you can edit it with Visual Studio Code, and it mm. just works. Um, I've written drivers for that for uh, for them for NRF24, which is from Nordic, which is a 2.4 gigahertz, 250k through to two megabit wireless system. Mm -hmm. um, the Semtech SX127 whatevers, uh, and that runs across Tiny CLR, Nano Framework, Windows 10 IoT Core, and I'm in the middle of a port to .NET Core 3 running on Nix on RPIs. Then um, uh, the RFM69, which is the Semtech SX1312, I think, mm -hmm. which is used in Davis weather stations and other uh, like the control units you see truck drivers using for the high abs. Mm -hmm. It's got crypto baked in, but the crypto is a bit crap because it's, um, well, it's AES128, but it, yeah, it uses the, it doesn't, it's, it's not cipher blockchaining. So if you send the same message over and over again, you get the same payload. There's no seeding or anything. Um, 
This is another device which runs in the native framework. You can see the stack temperature sensor. That's <laughs> a plain old LoRa device. And these right. are great for testing. Yeah, you, know, you can knock up a proof of concept in 20 minutes. You can I build it with the Arduino or the Nano framework or whatever, and you can get something going real quick. Yeah. You know, yeah. These sensors are great because they have a known power consumption and you know how long they're gonna last mm -hmm. based on the transmission rate. But sometimes you want something with a weird bunch of sensors. Uh, one yeah, of the I, yeah, actually, have you have you ever read a little bit about the new Wizlock model that Rack launched? Yeah, it's yeah. right over here. What do you think about it? I will be <laughs> interested because yeah, it's look it's just like a node with a bunch of sensors that you can plug in. You, you didn't send me one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll we are going that. to send you one, of course. <laughs> we'll Actually, I have I found that out after this presentation. <laughs> you want it because I think it's going to be amazing to you to start with that kit in your in the workshops that you have you are running in the school. Actually, I saw you. I was reading your website, and I love them. They make the the tab that you have which is the things that makes me happy. And I read oh. all the posts. I, it was super inspired, like for me, like do, see that you are, you are encouraging girls to work in, in STEM areas, which is amazing. And that like make me like, I was super happy when, when I read that. I was like, okay, these guys running a lot of workshops out there in the schools, so it will be, will be amazing to, to send them a, a Wizlock kit to start running those IoT projects in an easy, a quickly way uh, in, in the school. So, <laughs> One of the projects that some of my students at the girls' school are doing, though it looks a bit bodge, that's actually a bottle rocket. And you connect it up to a little compressor, and one of those lithium power packs that you use for starting your car. Um, mm -hmm. This is a hose from a home brew kit. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, it's designed basically to fall apart when it hits the ground so, to disperse the energy. It uses Command 3 M adhesives. These are book binding strips. Mm -hmm. uh, the fins are made from uh, the top, <laughs> cut out of the tops of ice cream containers yeah the oh, wow. one liter tops of <laughs> tops of That's one liter ice cream containers great hack so, wow. Super. so we learned learned a lot about oh, they learned a lot about the physics so i give them questions to go back to their to their teachers about you know how much reaction mass is in in the rocket because this is how fast it accelerated so in the rocket itself is one of these devices which is a battery powered Okay. NRF 24 module, mm -hmm. and we hitch up a, uh, he says rummaging around in the box. Uh, I think I've got one over here. Uh, we hitch up an accelerometer. It's an ADXL 345 accelerometer, and we can see how fast the rocket accelerates off the launch pad. One of my students did a project for monitoring water quality in the uh, her family has a farm down south here in New Zealand. And uh, here, here's the accelerometer. So if you happen to do devices which had growth connectors, that would be really good. So that's the accelerometer there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And everything's connected up with short cables. And it's got to the point where I use their baseboards. And then sometimes I chop the cables off the end and build my own custom sensors. So where's the other box? You create, you create your own plug and play systems. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm just looking. Everything's stored in these uh, <laughs> containers. So, uh, yeah. The so cable we... lab of a uh, hardware guy. <laughs> yeah. So that's an interesting sensor that we use for projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the uh, turbidity sensor, right? That, yeah, it's out of a big industrial dishwasher. Yeah. So we use those uh, to chuck into, uh, it's a floating sensor which goes on the on a lake attached to a wire tower, a, a steel fence post. Mm -hmm. And it floats up and down in the water and measures the water quality. That's the soil moisture sensor. Mm -hmm. They come out of Poland 
and they're the only ones I found which will survive. <laughs> yeah, they're not typical. cheap. Yeah. And then um, we also end up for one of the, for the walnuts. They dry the walnuts in one meter square bins, basically a cubic meter bin, and then we push these, put these in the bin. They're a steel cased. Yeah, they're waterproof. Uh, one more, yeah. and we put those inside gently. Put uh, walnuts on top, and uh, we can determine how they're drying. We're even looking at building an instrumented walnut, which can be put inside <laughs> to work out how fast the walnuts are drying. Because there's discussion about the most effective way to dry it: do you continually apply heat, or do you heat it up, then turn the fans off and the heaters off, and let the walnut, the moisture, redistribute through the walnut? Because mm -hmm. it's like a Three phase 10 kilowatt heater. So you're on first name terms with your local power company. <laughs> no, this is all of this is pretty interesting and it's so cool to see that you are encouraged. Like you have your students that are able in, in kind of projects which are which is amazing. I think we lost Jose. <laughs> he, he can be. <laughs> yeah, he's having, I think. Jose, are you there? Yes, you can see me. Strange. I think he's having. Um, connection. I can see him. You can see, you can see him? Yeah. I can see him. Yeah. Yeah. I, can, I can see him <laughs> in black. I don't know why, but well. <laughs> so, um, yeah, my specialist area is just anything a bit weird. I'm, I'm not a technical specialist. You know, I've got some deep skills. What is it? You, I'm breadth with, I've got breadth with some real deep spikes into bits and pieces. Um, sort of a general mix of skills and there's a re if anyone's interested there's a really good podcast about uh when women left coding and it, it's That's done by the N npr in the states and it was part of the economics uh podcast series and it talks a lot about when uh women exited coding because the first coder ever was uh later lady ada lovelace mm -hmm. and then you get into the likes of grace hopper um megan smith she was the cio of the united states dame steve shirley she she started a computing com a consult computer consulting company in the uk she wasn't getting any business because she would address sign a letter to stephanie shirley and then she found she got a lot more business when she changed the way she signed her letters to steve shirley <laughs> <Boy. laughs> <We laughs> yeah and then in the 90s, she had to start employing guys because of the equal rights legislation. And yeah. one of the, they had a big work from home program before it started. And she was doing this presentation, I think it was on YouTube, where she was talking about how they had a tape recording, you know, like an old cassette tape okay. of someone pounding away on a keyboard. And it was to cover up the noise of their kids in the playpen next to the desk where they were working. And that, I thought that was pretty cool. Pretty cool. Amazing. No, thanks for thanks for sharing all these like all the experience that you have in uh, that you have during the past years, like all the experiences you have uh, developing IoT projects, and as well like your experience uh, teaching people, uh, young girls and boys, to to start working in the STEM areas alongside with IoT, which is super important for for the future, and. I think I don't want to interrupt anyone's time. So thanks for for your time, for taking the time and share a little bit about you and about all the things that you have done. And I don't know, Jose, if you want to, to say something else. No, thank you very much, Bryn, for presenting today. It was amazing. And we'll, we'll have to get you a kit for sure. And uh, maybe you can port uh, the nano framework to it. <laughs> that would be cool. Is it running on board on the rack processor? On yes. That? Yes. It hasn't, we can, I've maybe we can that. do that. Maybe <laughs> we can do that. <laughs> we'll have a chat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It means spending a lot of time writing in C and C++. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'll yeah. have a work with the, uh, the Portuguese developer, Jose. Maybe we can... I, I'm not sure why, but I am having... <laughs> <laughs> The anyway, hell, <laughs> the hell comes out of um, Italy, so it's a real um, United Nations effort. Okay, 
<laughs> but we do have the ESP32 oh, as well. I as think well. we can finish the session. Thanks, Brian, again for for. Yep. Okay, coverage is falling apart. <laughs> it's over. I, okay, I'm not sure why, but I am having issues. So I can hear Jose. So I see that he is active on the YouTube yes. live streaming, but I can see you in the streaming platform and I can hear him. So I don't know how we are talking together. It's really strange. Let, let's so, call yeah, it. We're, we are let's, having this. Let's wrap it up. Anyway, <laughs> uh, thanks again for taking the time and talk with us and share a bit of your experience. And also thanks to everyone who is connected uh, and to those who stayed during the entire session. If you are watching this video later, feel free to leave your comments or questions in the comments and Brian, Jose, or, and, or I will be happy to answer your questions. So yeah. Thanks very much. See thanks. Bye-bye, guys. Bye, everyone. Thanks for being the first guest. And this is the real was pretty interesting. Bye-bye.